Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this ACFR exclusive event made possible by the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. Special thanks to Joe Dressen, who manages the Kennan Conversation Program, which has benefited so many of our committees, and to Victoria Pardini at Kennan for her amazing work setting up today's program. We're thrilled to have more than 100 of our members, associates, and representatives of our Young Leaders Initiative joining us today as we look at Russia, China competition in Central Asia. Another terrific fit, of course, with the global theme of our upcoming 25th annual conference in November. Just quickly, today's discussion is being recorded for future use by our committees and for posting on the ACFR website as well as the website of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's discussion, Jill Doherty. Jill is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, a centennial fellow at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service and a CNN contributor. In fact, Jill served as CNN correspondent for three decades, reporting for more than 50 countries, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, China, North Korea, and Russia. Her chief area of interest and expertise is Russia and the post-Soviet region. Jill last spoke for us uh, in Boise just a couple of years ago. So we're thrilled that all of us could be with her today for this program. So Jill, thank you, and it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. I really appreciate it. And I'm really glad to be here, even virtually. And thank you all for joining us. I understand there are some people who really know this region and know the post-Soviet space. So I'm really glad you're all here. This virtual event is a continuation of the Kennan Institute's Kennan Conversation series. And since 2015, in fact, our scholars and alumni have visited more than 30 cities across the United States to engage with audiences on issues related to Russia and to Eurasia. And we look forward, of course, to returning to normal, I hope sooner than later, so we can go back to our in-person Kennan conversations. But we're very glad that we can bring this to you online. And please note again, uh, I'm sure you have questions if you do, for, uh, you have questions for our speakers, you can submit them by using Zoom's Q&A feature, and that's down kind of at the bottom of your screen. You probably know this, but it's a Q&A feature. Or you can submit a question to kenan at wilsoncenter.org. So email questions, kenan at wilsoncenter.org. So, Today, we're going to turn our attention to a very important area, region of the world, sometimes overlooked here in the United States. Generally, it's Central Asia. Those countries that came out after the end of the Soviet Union, sometimes called the Stans, I prefer to call them by their names, and that would be Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. And our topic today, as Charlie said, is In Russia's Shadow, China's Rising Security Presence in Central Asia. You know, for, let's say, up uh, the past decade or so, China has grown to be the dominant external economic actor in Central Asia, and Russia has concentrated more on consolidating its position as the region's main external security guarantor. But this division of labor may be coming to an end. China's arms industry is growing. Beijing is now asserting itself as a strategic partner and also an arms supplier to Central Asia, putting itself in direct competition with Moscow. And that's some of what we're going to talk about today. So we have two real experts in Central Asia with us. First is Bradley Jarden. He's a Schwarzman Fellow at the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. And his current research focuses on the overseas activities of China's People's Army Police, the PAP, 
and the proliferation of Chinese su uh, surveillance technology in Eurasia. His work has appeared everywhere, but uh, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, and many other publications. And he spent five years as a journalist, in fact, in the post-Soviet space. He has an MA in Global Affairs from Tsinghua University, Beijing. Uh, second is Edward Lemon. He's Assistant Professor of Eurasian Affairs at the Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security. Uh, he previous hel previously held positions both at the Wilson Center and at Columbia University. His area of expertise is security issues in Central Asia. He's been published, again, <laughs> as all of our experts in many publications, but certainly Journal of Democracy, Central Asian Survey, Caucuses Survey, and many other publications. And he is the editor of the book, Critical Approaches to Security in Central Asia. And I cannot forget to remind everyone that both of these gentlemen have just published a report, which I, in fact, read. It is chock full of information and data. It's for our Ken and Cable publication series on this topic. You should have gotten it, I believe, by email. You can also find it on the website, wilsoncenter.org slash Kennan. So after that kind of brief introduction, we're going to be talking for, let's say about a half hour, 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it for questions. So get those questions ready. And I think, you know, Bradley, I think I'm going to start with you and kind of uh, moving off what we were saying at the top, which is really that, you know, Russia was the security actor for a long time. China with Belt and Road has been the economic actor. And that was kind of the paradigm that we've lived with. Is that still correct, Bradley? So thanks very much for that introduction. Um, the short answer is no, the, that paradigm is quickly shifting. So as our report shows, actually this division of labor, you know, we've long thought that Russia simply handles security while China, according to conventional wisdom, tackles uh, trade and infrastructure. Uh, that's its way of achieving its objectives in the region. But actually we in fact argue now that as China has risen, its security interests, the former Soviet Union have expanded dramatically in step, um, including the creation now of Beijing's first strategic base in the region, which is now in Tajikistan's Kono Barakshan uh, Autonomous Region. So commentators have long been puzzled um, by the lack of friction between the two actors in this part of the world. Um, you know, spheres of influence literature would have us believe that, you know, Russia would perceive China as a competitor, a potential threat to its interests in the region. Yet there appears to be very little tension. So we're kind of exploring why that is. Um, one reason for the discrepancy might be a question more of timing. Um, as our data seems to indicate, there's a general lack of friction, largely because Russia's arms transfers to the region have actually remained surprisingly stable for the last couple of decades, um, even though China's share of the market has risen. Actually, China's been eating into the, the share of NATO allies like Turkey, Canada, and France, as well as Ukraine. So it's actually been furthering um, Russian objectives of pushing out rivals from the region and having a stable partner um, with China. So in this sense, there hasn't really been direct competition yet um, between the two actors. And that would explain um, why Russia has been receptive to increasing um, kind of collaborating, because both of them have um, complementary uh, agendas. And uh, Edward Lemon, what do you think? Let's, I'd like to get your view on that kind of overall, you know, economic versus security. And now, which we're hearing from Bradley Jordan, uh, it's changing. So what's, what's your view? I think Bradley, you may be muted. There we go. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry, Did that you... was me who was muted. No um, problem. That this happens all the time. Did you hear my question? Yes, indeed. No, so I think, you know, that division of labor sort of as our data shows has sort of been broken down. What we've seen is China's security interests in the region um, increasing for a number of reasons. Obviously, um, China sort of has viewed the region primarily sort of through the lens of Xinjiang province, obviously in the, the uh, sort of uh, 
in the, the west of China, obviously a Muslim majority area that has sort of been the source, at least from the Chinese government's perspective perspective of sort of terrorist threat, extremist threat. And they've been sort of very interested in using Central Asia as a way to secure what they view as being their sort of aggressive Western front. Um, as Bradley mentioned, um, you know, with the launch of Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, we've seen a ramping up of Chinese investments in the region. And this hasn't always been received positively by um, the Central Asian uh, population. So we've seen a number of protests, um, a number of attacks um, by uh, uh, citizens on Chinese uh, infrastructure and investment projects in places like Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. So as China ramps up its sort of uh, investments in the region, it's receiving some backlash. And so its security uh, interests have increased. I think the other factor that we need to add to this is the Afghanistan factor. Obviously, Afghanistan has a border with um, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. And it's that lengthy border, uh, 1,300 kilometer border with, with Tajikistan that's been viewed as particularly vulnerable. And so that's why um, Tajik, that's why China opened its first overseas military facility in the region in 2016. Uh, quite near the uh, near the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan, but also near the border with China, because there's a concern that uh, militants may and uh, militancy may spill over from Afghanistan into Central Asia and from Central Asia into Xinjiang province. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I still want to keep kind of broad because there, there's a lot. To, you mentioned Afghanistan. I want to definitely get into that, but keeping it a little bit broader. You know, Russia and China have their alliance, this grand strategic partnership. So, uh, and it's really noticeable. I mean, right now, you know, with COVID and all of it, it's, it's there um, very forcefully. But is that sustainable in Central Asia? Bradley, maybe we'll start with you and then we can get Edward to um, join in. Mm -hmm. So sure. Um... So China, Russia and China have really, you know, since 1991, they've really termed this once antagonistic relationship. You know, they were major Cold War adversaries. They've turned it into something today resembling, you know, a full-fledged strategic partnership. This includes everything from uh, joint military training exercises in Russia's Far East, uh, the joint bomber patrols in the Pacific, and even the sharing of uh, missile defense systems. So it's become a really broad, um, wide-ranging uh, partnership. Um, it's strategic. They both have a shared common interest of pr pursuing, you know, what they would argue is multipolarity, basically the dilution of U.S. power on the world stage. Um, but at the same time, it's also highly pragmatic and practical. The two increasingly share, you know, compatible economic, political and security interests in a broad number of ways. Still, there are tensions. Um, ultimately, there is still some lingering mistrust between the two. And despite, you know, grand ambitions for cooperation, um, strategic regions like Central Asia are particularly interesting because they actually offer us um, a window into the possible tensions in the long run. One of the core tensions that remains um, in this partnership is essentially um, its asymmetric nature. Beijing holds most of the economic and political power in this relationship. And this is very readily apparent in Central Asia. Um, in fact, the region itself is witnessing a major rebalancing of power, um, where both Russia and the U.S. appear to be in decline, and China is at this stage emerging as perhaps the most influential player, which is somewhat unsurprising. I mean, China has brought to the region a very broad vision for regional connectivity. It has a vast appetite for uh, energy resources in the region. It actually has broad interest in expanding its security and technological infrastructure. The provision of smart city programs. Um, we're also seeing telecommunications infrastructure pursued by Chinese companies such as Huawei. So this is beneficial. In some ways, China is an ideal partner for the governments of the region. And unlike the West, China actually makes no demands for political reform in exchange for this um, cooperation. Ultimately, this um, dynamic also serves Russian interests. Russia is pursuing its own um, vision of interconnectivity, especially with the Eurasian Economic Union. So this customs union actually um, kind of standardizes the legal norms and also the taxes and duties and so on um, between nations trading with one another, while the Chinese aspect focuses on you know, the infrastructure that allows this connectivity and 
economic transfers to take place. So both of these agendas are actually mutually um, overlapping. Um, where tensions will start to show will essentially be as China starts ramping up its arms transfers, its military industry has been growing. Um, it's now the world's fifth largest supplier of weapons. Um, so we can expect to see China eating more into Russia's share of the market, especially if, as Edward mentioned, um, as local backlash happens and we're seeing attacks and so forth on Chinese infrastructure, Chinese factories, there'll be more impetus for the Chinese government to um, protect both its citizens abroad, but also its infrastructure and its investments. And I think that will bring a, a logic of securitization to the region with further um, Chinese uh, growth in that area. Bradley, um, could you just clarify exactly why the animosity among the actual public toward the Chinese? What, what is going on there? So with uh, Central Asian animosity largely, there's one of the main factors for it is ultimately China wishes to pursue security in the region, but this is often out of step with its um, economic policies. A large part of what China is trying to pursue economically in Central Asia is part of its um, internal pol political rebalancing. As China engaged in its economic reforms in the 1980s, it left the coastal regions very well developed and advanced, but regions such as Xinjiang and Inner China fell behind in developmental terms. So China saw this as a source of instability, particularly in Xinjiang. So the, thought, the thinking goes that by connecting Central Asia with Xinjiang, they can stimulate growth um, in the region, they can pacify any unrest essentially and help integrate it with the rest of the country more efficiently. The problem is that part of the Belt and Road's um, design is actually to export things like excess capacity from China, but also to pro provide um, sources of employment for Chinese workers. So often what you see in Central Asia is China will construct factories in the region with the promise of providing jobs, especially in local towns and villages. Um, but actually it's providing jobs for Han Chinese laborers. And this is a huge problem. So if China wants to achieve security in Central Asia and stability, one of the largest signs of, um, one of the largest factors for unrest in the region is actually the high youth unemployment rates which China is actually not seeking to redress. So some of these tensions between the economic imperatives and the security aspects um, are actually creating um, backlash. I would also explain further that in Xinjiang province, um, it's home to a minority population known as the Uyghurs. They are a Muslim minority um, with similar linguistic connections and cultural to the rest of Central Asia. There are also a large population of Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and other Central Asian ethnic groups within Xinjiang. So as China has began ramping up a very draconian policy of re-education, these so-called re-education camps, um, which have up to 1.5 million Uyghurs, um, Kazakhs and Kyrgyz um, training within them, um, this is actually creating tensions because a lot of family networks, um, a lot of cross-border ties, cross-border trade has been disrupted by these policies. And it's actually created backlash in the region. Uh, people who've lost contact with their relatives in Xinjiang and are demanding that the government actually supports and defends their rights um, against the Chinese government. So some of this backlash um, also plays into perceptions of China and China being seen as um, a threatening actor. That's really fascinating. Um, just want to remind our audience that, again, if you have questions, and I'm sure now you do, uh, that you can submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And then also you can go online, send an email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org. Edward Lemon, I wanted to pick up, you know, uh, Bradley was mentioning the United States, and I guess we might as well jump into that right now. Uh, the Trump's Central Asian policy was released in February, and, you know, in reading it, it seems that the main thrust, at least as I read it, um, was, you know, sovereignty, independence for the Central Asian states. In other words, jump, don't jump into bed with the Chinese or the Russians. Um, how would you interpret it, and is it a, um, let's say, workable, wise policy 
Sure, no. So I think it's a sort of thinly veiled, you know, they don't name names within the uh, Central Asia strategy, but it's certainly, you know, it's implied that by emphasizing sovereignty and sort of the independence of Central Asian states to choose amongst partners. Um, uh, you know, obviously there's, a, there's a, there are undertones that the United States is obviously desires that the Central Asian states don't pursue um, such close relations with, with China and Russia. And that was certainly the message that uh, Pompeo made on his trip to the region back in February, uh, meeting, uh, for example, with the family members of people who have been detained in the camps in Xinjiang, you know, very sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the anti-China sort of message was certainly sort of there within his trip. But I think, you know, the United States has very limited tools at their disposal. You know, uh, we looked sort of as part of sort of our broader research at the figures on security assistance to the region. And those figures have fallen by 97% since 2010. Mm. You know, we obviously saw the region becoming of tremendous importance to the United States immediately following 9-11 uh, and the uh, invasion of Afghanistan. You know, we saw the US building bases with Russian permission uh, in uh, Uzbekistan and in Kyrgyzstan. Um, we saw sort of a peak in bilateral exercises, joint exercises of seven a year between 2002 and 2004. But since then, you know, the US interest in the region has waned um, as a result of sort of the desire to obviously uh, and, and the withdrawal from Afghanistan and sort of more, more broader sort of uh, uh, American retrenchment uh, around the world and desire to sort of uh, decrease their role in the region. So I think, you know, whilst um, the US government may, may want to um, sort of encourage the Central Asian states to pursue different partnerships. They're not really offering anything themselves that can compete with the amounts of money, the amounts of security assistance um, that are being offered by uh, countries like China and Russia. Of course, it varies from country to country. Um, so I think we need to sort of be careful about sort of making sweeping generalizations. Countries like Kazakhstan, for example, has a much more you know, developed economy and has a much more diversified portfolio of sort of relationships, um, is, would be more open to US uh, advances um, than countries like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the sort of smallest, poorest countries that are very heavily dependent on both Russia and China for um, trade investment migration um, along with security assistance so i think the united states you know has a limited limited uh, tools at its disposal to really realize these goals and bradley i'm presuming you agree with that that there's not a lot that the united states actually can do or maybe i should ask that it wants to do yeah and un unfortunately as edward mentions the um you know, U.S. participation, particularly in um, terms of security provision, has plummeted 97%, which is a pretty stark figure. Um, we've also seen U.S. influence slowly wind down. Um, the closing, closing of its military bases, both the one in Uzbekistan, following, um, following um, human rights um, backlash there against the Uzbek government in 2005. We also saw the closing of the Manas air base in uh, Kyrgyzstan. So that's saw sort of the last kind of elements of U.S. hard power in the region. And then by 2015, we saw a winding down of the U.S. kind of um, distribution network where it was using uh, infrastructure to transport uh, materials for its uh, war aims in Afghanistan. So essentially, as the U.S. has always seen Central Asia as something of an appendage in its, you know, its conflict in Afghanistan. So in the long run, we really see that as um, maneuvers are being made now to try and withdraw the US from that conflict, um, we'll see um, decreasing interest in Central Asia in and of itself independent of that conflict. So I think in the long run, these trends look uh, very difficult to reverse at this stage, particularly with um, the degree to which China has really um, grown as an actor there in the last uh, decade. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think we're getting some good questions, which I'm getting here on my trusty phone. But um, let me ask one maybe last question, and then we'll jump into some questions from the audience. Um, Edward, I wanted to ask you, I believe you were talking about the Tajikistan base that China has, that the People's Liberation Army has built. And um, that, of course, kind of raises this issue that we began with, which is 
could this really turn into conflict? Are we just talking about friendly competition or how conflictual could this get? Could it actually get into armed conflict? What are we talking about, Edward? Yeah, well, Tajikistan is also host to a Russian base. It's its largest base, um, with the exception of Syria, outside of, outside of Russia. Um, 7,000 troops stationed there since sort of as a sort of hangover from, from the Soviet Union. So Russia really has traditionally been the main security guarantor of what is the weakest state um, and the one with the longest border with Afghanistan. I think, you know, when they decided to open the base, um, the Chinese government was deferential to this being Russia's near abroad, its sphere of influence. And so they did send, uh, it was a delegation of Russian uh, specialists and I believe government officials who visited China before the opening of this base. And so there certainly was sort of a consultation um, from the reports that we had that took place whereby Russia obviously acceded to China's desire to open this facility. You know, we're not talking about um, we're talking about a sort of significant geopolitical move, um, but the base itself, you know, from the estimates that we have from the satellite imagery, you know, has, it has a heliport, you know, it could, barracks may be hosting between two and 300 troops. So it's not, you know, it's not a significant sort of, uh, significant uh, facility, but it's obviously symbolically a very important sort of uh, uh, signifier of China's growing security role in the region. You know, at the same time, as opening the base, China sort of ramped up its joint exercises in the region. In fact, you know, traditionally it had done its joint exercises, joint military exercises through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is uh, sort of a, sort of what's viewed as a sort of Chinese-led, but although Russia is also a member, sort of organization that focuses on Central Asia security in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's moved to a more bilateral model. And so around the time it opened the base, it also organized its first bi bilateral um, counter-terrorism exercises with the Tajik army. So I think at this point, you know, I think there's a mutual sort of interest as we already discussed in sort of pushing out the United States, that's already been accomplished, um, and in stabilizing the region against any negative spillovers from Afghanistan. You know, I think at this point, the alliance is still held together by those uh, sort of uh, those factors. But I think as we move forward, and as we've already discussed, and we see in the paper, you know, we see China's share of the arms market increased from 1.5% a decade ago to 18% today, we're obviously seeing sort of China's role increasing. And, you know, it, it remains to be seen, and it's difficult to make predictions. Um, but if the trends do continue, um, then I think Russia will start to see its interests being encroached upon. And so then it'll we'll have to see how Russia responds to that um, and what's the sort of tipping point where Russia really views its interests as being a threat. But certainly the trends we identify in the paper point to, particularly since uh, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012 and the launch of Belt and Road in 2013, we're seeing an increasingly sort of assertive, muscular um, Chinese policy towards the region. So I think as China's interests continue to grow, its sort of hard power projection will uh, inevitably follow, and that's the sort of trend that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I'll just jump in with one distinction that actually China was very careful to say that this was rather than being the PLA or the Chinese military, its facilities belonging to the People's Armed Police, which is a paramilitary wing of the Communist Party. It's a force whose main task is essentially defending the Communist Party or the regime itself. So it now does a lot of, since it's restructuring in recent years, it's tasked a lot with uh, counter-terror operations. And it's also very active in Xinjiang. So now we're seeing it's equivalent to the Russian National Guard, essentially. So as the People's Armed Police has started doing far more um, joint exercises in Central Asia since 2019 to increase the interoperability of uh, these domestic security forces, um, we've actually seen Russia trying to respond in the case of Uzbekistan to try and promote the Russian National Guard now as a, a external force. So that's an interesting competitive dynamic, but still in its infancy at the moment, difficult to predict how that will develop, but certainly one to keep an eye on. And um, on the interoperability of those weapons, maybe you mentioned it, but I'm not quite sure I know the answer to this, which is Chinese and Russian weapons, are they, I know they do war games together, et cetera, but uh, are they interoperable? A lot of them are. So China's um, 
domestic arms industry, a lot of the weapon systems were actually based on uh, first Soviet designs in the early years. Um, and then now some of them are even reverse engineered um, from mm -hmm. Russian designs, which is, has long been a source of friction between them. And it's one of the reasons Russia has always been hesitant to provide some of its more high-end, high-grade weapon systems, knowing that they will get replicated. But this kind of dynamic has changed in recent years where um, because of the vast amounts of R&D that, that China's investing um, in its arms industry, essentially Russia has concluded that it's better to gain in the short term by selling these systems systems now than wait in the long term where China may have competitor systems anyway. Yeah, very interesting. Well, let's go to questions. Um, again, I'm, we're getting quite a few, but don't forget you can either email it uh, if you want to, whoops, kenan at wilsoncenter.org, or you can use the Q&A function. So here's the, uh, of the first one, it's kind of interesting too. Uh, in the case of significantly increased Sino-Russian competition in Central Asia, what elements, for example, historical cooperation, ethnicity, shared heritage, perceived dominance, do you see the two countries playing off to win the Central Asian nations to their respective sides? Uh, who would like to take that? Bradley, Edward? Sure, no, I think I can, I can take that one. Okay. I think, you know, certainly in terms of soft power, um, Russia still has the considerable advantage. You know, I think as we've discussed sort of some of the dynamics of Sinophobia, but there's still a lot of Russophilia in the region. You know, when we look at sort of uh, surveys that were done around the time of the annexation of Crimea, um, you know, the most popular world leader in, I think it was in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, you know, Putin had overwhelming popularity, higher popularity than in Russia. It's, in fact, I think 80% of respondents saying that they, you know, had a favorable view of Putin as a leader of Russia and sort of, uh, you know, his role in sort of reasserting Russian presence in the world. You know, and I think, I think the key to that is, is a point that Bradley made earlier, that Belt and Road is about uh, exporting excess capacity, right? And I think a lot of the tensions, as we've said, with Chinese investment projects is that they're the labor, at least part of the labor is Chinese, are Chinese citizens. Whereas Russia, particularly for countries like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, which are two of the top five migration dependent countries in the world, you know, Russia offers them a place to export excess labor um, mm. capacity. Um, and so it's a way for them to provide jobs. And, you know, the Tajik economy before COVID-19, you know, a third of the Tajik economy and around a third of the Kyrgyz economy came from migrants living abroad. And so I think for the general public, you know, people are very thankful that Russia uh, offers an opportunity to, uh, to uh, allow their economies to develop. I think you know, that's combined with the fact that the region obviously was part of the Soviet Union, and there's a lot of nostalgia towards the Soviet Union um, as, as a sort of, uh, not as a sort of uh, negative empire, but as an empire that brought development, um, stability, opportunities to the region, increased literacy, all these different things. So I think for many people, there's, there's still a very positive view of, of Russia. And I think you know, that's, that's something that continues to play into Russia's advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a good follow-up to something that we were talking about a few minutes ago. How are the Chinese responding to the anti-Chinese expressions in Central Asia? Uh, one thing we've seen with that uh, that's been interesting is a lot of um, local Chinese companies are actually investing a lot more in private security contractors. So this is actually a growing um, field. Very little um, you know, data-driven analysis has been done of this at the moment. This is kind of an emerging trend where you're seeing companies turning to private security contractors. Another thing is investment in local PR companies. So Chinese companies are actually spending a lot more in PR initiatives um, to basically try and improve their image in the region. Um, so this is kind of low level, um, ground up sort of initiatives that are taking place from the top down level from the Chinese government itself. Unfortunately, there hasn't been enough um, shifting to local government needs. Um, ultimately, the governments of Central Asia have been pretty quick to respond, um, shutting down anti-China protests across the region, silencing people who are criticizing China. So essentially the um, regime interests or government interests um, are often 
um, disconnected from those of the, the population to some degree. Um, China is very useful for them as a source of um, investment, infrastructure, helping them to modernize their economies at a time where they're struggling. And it's also ultimately China conducts its economic relations in the region in a very non-transparent manner. Mm. This lack of transparency actually increases local corruption, which actually makes uh, the governments more receptive to Chinese investments and, and so on. So actually part of the problem is that the very strategies that China is using to advance its economic interests in the region are actually what's disrupting, disconnecting it um, as an appealing actor to the, the local populations themselves. So this, these competitive advantages may be in the long run more of a disadvantage and it will depend really on how local companies and so on um, choose to address this, Chinese companies, I mean, um, whether they can really improve their image there, but without um, wider structural reform on the part of the Chinese government and how it conducts its policies in the region, um, I'm not very hopeful. Hmm. You know, I don't know that this was actually part of your study, but um, if you know the answer, I'd be very intrigued. With young people who are studying foreign languages, do they tend to study English or Chinese or Russian? I mean, obviously, a lot of them speak Russian. Yeah, I think the figures sort of, I'm now trying to think of the, this wasn't part of this study, but I had mm -hmm. figures, figures for part of research that I was doing last year. The figures from Russia are still much higher in terms of, uh, both in terms of sort of the Russian number of people studying in Russian language schools that are still viewed um, as being more prestigious than studying in local language schools in most of the countries, give you more opportunities to work internationally, for example, both in terms of local local schools and in terms of student populations, you know, the student population in Russia, for example, um, you know, it's still uh, far you know, ahead of, of the Chinese um, level of interest in the Chinese language, but maybe Bradley knows more about sort of the level of Chinese language being studied in the region. I know it's obviously been increasing. Yeah, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, unfortunately, but China has been investing a lot in its uh, Confucian Institutes, Confucius Institutes, which is really the main way it promotes uh, Chinese language and culture um, in the region, but it's also opening up a number of scholarship grants um, for Central Asians. In fact, when I studied at Tsinghua University in Beijing, I often saw a lot of Central Asians um, who were studying there. Um, many of them were on scholarship grants and, and programs, uh, especially leadership programs, um, development in different sectors. I mean, a lot of the Kazakhs I met, for example, a lot of them are studying environmental politics um, and environmental technology, and kind of trying to move into those sectors, doing internships with Chinese companies working in these fields and so on. So China's certainly growing as a, as a soft power influencer in the region. Um, but still lags significantly behind Russia and even uh, behind um, English with the U.S. Um, soft power policies. Mm -hmm. um, another question, and this requires you to break down individual countries. Um, do Central Asian nations have a preference between Russia and China? And if so, which countries prefer Russia, which prefer China? Yeah, well, I think just to, to come back to our paper sort of on the arms transfers that sort of I think does indicate the sort of the general relationship. Um, so, you know, we've had the greatest number of arms being sold to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, as I said, is the most, the richest country in the region with the sort of highest uh, level of economic development. And that sort of allowed it to sort of, sort of pursue relatively close ties to Russia. It's a member of the Euro Eurasian Economic Union, for example, whilst also maintaining relatively strong uh, relations with China. Um, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, as we said, are the poorest countries, um, the ones that are most dependent on Russia, the site of the two sort of largest Russian bases in the country. Um, over 80% of their arms have come from Russia. In the case of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, actually higher, over 90% of their arms. So they're really sort of within Russia's sphere of influence. But at the same time, uh, you know, as we said, China's uh, role both in their economy and security has risen. So they're sort of, they've become sort of dependent on both countries. And so it's now difficult to say which one they're more dependent on. And then the other two countries in the region, Uzbekistan traditionally had favored China over Russia, had always tried to distance itself from Russia since becoming independent in 1991 under Islam Karimov, who pursued a sort of autarkic 
um, economic policy trying to make the country independent of foreign powers. But since he died in 2016, we've actually seen a, a sort of turn back to Russia, becoming an observer in the Eurasian Economic Union, um, signing a number of important arms deals. And so we've seen sort of uh, Uzbekistan's sort of pivoting back towards Russia. At present, Uzbekistan is the only country that in terms of gross sort of dollar terms, is the only country that has bought more weapons from China than from Russia. But that's sort of, it's now sort of pivoting maybe a little bit back towards Russia. And then Turkmenistan is the sort of, it's a, it's a neutral country, a very isolated country, and it's sort of attempted to pursue, um, traditionally sort of had stronger relations with Russia, but now has stronger relations with China. It's obviously one of the world's largest gas exporters, 80% like of its um, uh, sort of export revenues come from, uh, from, from the gas sector. And historically, those gas, uh, those gas exports went through Russia. But more recently, in the past decade, they've uh, pivoted towards China. So I think that sort of um, differentiates each country. So I think the most dependent, the weakest countries are the most dependent on both Russia and China. The other countries have managed to pursue a greater degree of independence. Mm -hmm. I would add to that, if, if I can just add a short comment. Um, I would, when we were talking about these um, xenophobic sentiments and so on, um, these kind of this groundswell of kind of anti-Chinese sentiments actually been much more noticeable in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So the states where there's a more relatively open press and communication, um, by contrast to the rest of the region, um, basically there's a lot more um, room for these kind of sentiments, particularly in Kyrgyzstan, and also largely because there's a much larger Kazakh diaspora, Kyrgyz diaspora um, within Xinjiang province as well. So in relation to China's repression uh, domestically and internally, that's kind of had a knock-on effect in terms of popular perceptions in those two countries in particular. Whereas in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, there's been at the very least very little data on it in terms of perceptions, but it seems that at the very least there hasn't been any large-scale protests or any signs of that sort of protest activity. You know, I have to ask both of you, as I was reading your report, I was amazed by all the data in it. And I was just wondering right now whether um, it was difficult to compile all of that. Um, are there, were there security concerns? I mean, there are files that in, in data that you can't get into because of security. How did you do this? Um, well, I think a lot of the sort of um, data on security cooperation is sort of in the public public sphere, public realm, um, you know, doing searches in Russian, Chinese, local languages, you know, China and Russia are both sort of very interested in projecting to the public their important role in Central Asian security, which is obviously framed in terms of being sort of a mutually beneficial strategic partnership. You know, obviously getting data on things like China's uh, military facility was more difficult. In fact, that only came to light. There were rumors, um, but it only came to light and was confirmed in 2019. Um, by a, I think it was a Wall Street Journal correspondent. So, you know, I think most of the data that we had was, was publicly accessible. You know, the, on arms transfers, there's something called the CIPRI database, which we used, but then when we looked at the figures and compared them with the reports of, of arms transfers that we'd collated from the local media, we found that numerous large deals were missing from that data set. So, you know, so we augmented that with figures and, and deals that we found, but, you know, I think, all of the data that we present in the report is based on sort of public, public sources. Well, you did a great job. Uh, here's a good question. Um, how is the decline in Russia's economy due to lower oil, oil prices and other factors affecting its ability to compete with China in Central Asia? Yeah, this is obviously a very topical question and I think it's, it remains, remains to be seen. I think, you know, it's not just about falling oil prices. I think they're important and that will, you know, that's going to have a negative effect, particularly on the sort of hydrocarbon rich countries, Kazakhstan, definitely Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Um, and also, you know, it's not just the, the, the decline in, in sort of the Russian economy affecting uh, oil prices or being affected by oil prices. It's also obviously the reduction in the level of migration that we're seeing. Um, and so this, as we, as I said before, had been a key sort of tool of Russian influence. But now we've seen remittances, money sent back from migrants, even in the month of March, which was before sort of the um, most sort of 
the effects of COVID had really started being felt, we saw remittances fall by half. So I think, you know, I think the downturn will affect Russia's capacity to um, fund its military and fund its uh, sort of continued security presence in the region. But I think it'll also affect um, the bilateral ties uh, that, and then the influence that it has through things like soft power. So I think it's it's going remains to be seen, and obviously China itself is is not completely immune to uh, to the effects of COVID. Maybe Bradley can comment on sort of how, how how it may affect relations with China as well. Right, because COVID is a factor. So if you could mention that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So of course, um, with COVID, we have the issue of of a widespread demand. Um, demand side issues with China being able to export its goods around the world, which will of course have impacts on its supply in, in case of its production, its factory, use of factories and so on. So you actually see a decline in uh, demand for energy, essentially, which is gonna um, be a major problem for its relations, which have been extremely imbalanced um, across the region with China mainly purchasing hydrocarbons from the region and exporting its own goods, but buys very little um, other goods beyond uh, energy products. And a lot of the countries in the region, particularly Tajikistan, there's a major trade deficit um, between the two. And this ties into other issues such as the swelling debt problems across the region where mm -hmm. to finance a lot of the Belt and Road product, uh, infrastructure and so on, China gives vast loans um, and often um, the states are struggling to pay these back. So now with things such as falling energy demands, falling demands in general for goods from Central Asia, you'll see the countries struggling even more to pay these uh, Chinese debts. There may even be defaults. Um, and we've seen how some debt alleviation has been handled in the region, has been deeply unpopular with the population. So this has been... For example, in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, we've seen concessions whereby gold mines are given to Chinese companies, um, basically in exchange for a debt alleviation. So in, in the case of Tajikistan it was even more extreme in 2011, where you know, there's a lot of rumor that one of the border delineations that was made at that time may have been in response to debt factors as well so an actual concession of territorial claims wow so this is um big questions over sovereignty and over you know economic rights and so on in the region um are going to be in question now as debt grows and chinese demand declines yes i guess china is not forgiving a lot of debt um in the region um here is an intriguing question which leader putin or xi has the most difficult internal issues confronting him and what may be the impact? <laughs> this is a great question. So uh, who wants to take it first? Well, I think if I had to pick between the two, um, I would think that Putin has the greater challenges. You know, we're, we can't get accurate statistics on COVID coming out of Russia, but you know, when we're looking particularly at the sort of images of hospitals in places like the North Caucasus, um, many of the, the regions of Russia, um, if we're shifting focus away from the sort of more lucrative parts of uh, wealthier parts of European Russia, you know, the, the healthcare system um, looks sort of to be um, in serious trouble. And so I think, you know, this is going to be a test for Putin's popularity. Um, in terms of you know his ability to provide public services and, you know this has often been in russia the source of protests for example in the changing of the age of uh, when people could receive their state pension a year or, year or so ago so i think you know i think it's symptomatic of the sort of kleptocratic um, authoritarian state that putin has elected whereby you know his, his cronies have made billions of dollars and siphoned them off into sort of offshore bank accounts but not invested uh, enough in sort of things like public health care. So I think it's going to be a test for Putin's popularity, coupled with the fact that um, oil prices, as we already mentioned, have obviously plummeted and that making up such a large proportion of the Russian economy that's going to sort of have long term impacts on uh, Russia's ability to project power abroad. So I would think my my answer would be that Putin is the is the one who's has the most serious domestic 
domestic challenges ahead. Okay, Bradley, what do you think? I would largely agree um, with Edward's assessment that Putin um, has far larger um, domestic challenges. I would say what China is going to have to deal with more now is external um, relations and particularly perceptions of China. Um, you know, a leaked um, Communist Party memo essentially said that the perceptions of China are at their lowest point since the Tiananmen um, Square massacre. Um, so that's a large admission um, from them internally that essentially the backlash for COVID, their handling, bungled handling of it, and even cover-ups and silencing of um, whistleblowers um, has really created um, severe backlash that they're going to have to deal with. At the same time, China is also um, facing a lot of other issues such as um, the situation now in Hong Kong. It's also dealing now currently with uh, further border clashes with India at the moment and as well as um, generally backlash against its harsh repressive campaign in Xinjiang. So at the moment, China's dealing on a lot of fronts with essentially what looks like overreach, um, where it's um, angered quite a lot of people, and it's going to struggle to kind of um, reclaim that, that public international trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are, we have like eight, well, actually we have, I would say, five to six minutes to go before we have to turn it back. So um, here's a question, and I think it's a good one to kind of end on and really get into, which is, and we touched on it, but here, here's a different phrasing. What price may the US, might the US pay for its policy in Central Asia? And the policy, of course, being, you know, a policy of pulling out of Central Asia. So could you, um, either Edward or Bradley, who wants to kind of take us into that area? Yeah, well, I think as Bradley sort of opened on, I think Central Asia sort of from a perspective of sort of scholars focused on uh, international relations is a very interesting sort of case study in, because it is a region obviously that borders two great powers, Russia and China, and obviously the US is already the distant power. So I think it really gives us a snapshot of sort of what a sort of Chinese uh, dominated um, regional order can look like where China, not the United States, is the provider of public goods, which is obviously the sort of Kindleberger's conception of, you know, what a, what a hegemon should do, you know, and obviously this is a role traditionally around the globe that was, that was uh, performed by the United States, particularly sort of in the immediate aftermath of World War II and continuing you know, uh, continuing to this day, but obviously we've seen the United States you know, it sort of gradually retreating from its role of, of sort of as, as the sort of leading uh, global hegemon, and we're seeing China obviously rising and taking a greater role. Um, you know, for example, in in its response to COVID. Um, so I think you know Central Asia is is very interesting so far as you know in the response to COVID. China um, has sort of taken a lead in sending medical teams, um, various tranches of aid, um, ventilators, PPE to these to the different countries. Of course, the United States has also pledged um, a few million dollars in support, but sort of it, it's, it's, its support has been less significant than than uh, China um, and and Russia. So I think you know the the cost. It's difficult to say because I think the, for the United States, this was never a priority and the United States could never claim to have been the main external partner for Central Asia. That was historically Russia. And I think our research points to that now, you know, that balance now shifting maybe towards China um, on balance being the main external partner for the region. Um, so I think, you know, Afghanistan is, is the other sort of factor here as we sort of watching moving towards the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we're also seeing China and Russia um, taking a sort of uh, an interest in, in what happens in Afghanistan. But obviously it's very difficult to predict uh, what's going to happen there. So I think, you know, the, the price is sort of a gradual sort of, uh, it's, it's conceding that the United States um, is not the hegemon in this region, but then it probably never was. So it's it's, it's uh, sort of, it, it's more of an interesting, from my perspective, more of an interesting sort of sort of snapshot of what this sort of post-Western, post-American world may look like. 
-hmm. And Bradley, you know, same question, but maybe a little side issue, you know, which we just heard from Edward, which is it never was. The U.S. never really was a uh, hegemon in the region, but should it be? I mean, is Central Asia important to the United States? Or, as many people say, not so much? Yeah, I agree with uh, Edward. It's unlikely that Central Asia is ever going to be a very prominent uh, fixture of U.S. power, and especially as the U.S. is now retrenching around the globe and figuring out its real strategic interests, which mm -hmm. appear to line the Pacific and with the whole rebalancing to Asia. Um, Central Asia was always going to fall behind in terms of priorities, but that doesn't mean that it's unimportant. I think ultimately what China is pursuing, the very idea of connectivity in the region, is not on itself a bad concept. In fact, the US could benefit from increased connectivity in the region. I think the real question is one of what models of connectivity are we pursuing and what kind of norms are going to be leading that integration process. The Chinese model appears to have a lot of underlying structural issues, as we've uh, discussed throughout this talk, um, and may actually be you know, decreasing interconnectivity, achieving the opposite aims uh, because of this um, model that's being pursued. So there is room for US norms, uh, liberalization policies and so on. They could actually create freer and open uh, trading environments um, in the region and could connect uh, the Eurasian landmass. So I think that overall, that is a good overarching strategy. It's just a case of what tools, what methods and what values do we ultimately want to pursue in implementing this, this vision? Yeah. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, really. I learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience did too. Uh, Bradley Jarden and Edward Lemon, thank you very much. You're experts. Now I know why you're experts. And I urge everybody to read the report. It's really, as I said, chock full of a lot of data and a lot of information. And I'm going to throw it back to Charlie. Charlie, thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. I think you have done a superb job moderating this discussion and packing so many insights um, into this for us. Uh, start my video, sorry. I'm not completely there adept, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. It's, it's good to be with you. And uh, deepest thanks to, to Bradley and Edward uh, for your fascinating presentations and I know that, that uh, our membership, uh, widely writ in ACFR, will be looking forward to reading your report in depth and uh, we'll work with Wilson Center to make sure we have it on our website, linked to our website, and we just can't thank you enough. And uh, before closing for our ACFR members, I'd like to mention that our next online event, which will cap our program year, will be an ACFR collaboration with the U.S. Institute of Peace. This will be a virtual guided tour of what USIP calls the Peace Trail in Washington, D.C. They will take us around to a number of sites, including the Albert Einstein Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, and a whole lot more. So it'll be an exciting way, we think, for our members to gather virtually in DC as we look forward to gathering again in person once these present difficulties are behind us. So mark your calendars now for Wednesday, June 17th, 3 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be sending out a notice sometime next week. So again, many thanks to Jill, Edward, Bradley, Joe Dressen, Victoria, all our friends at Wilson Center and the Kennan Institute. And thanks to all of our ACFR participants today, as always, for all you're doing to keep us united, informed, and engaged. So everybody stay well, keep the faith, and we'll see you soon.